Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. How's everybody doing? Praise the Lord. Yes. Oh, we, I just love coming to this place. We love your pastors. You, you do know that you have some great pastors. Amen? And uh, uh, I don't take for granted for one moment the fact that when he, that he can go away with his family and that he entrusts me to be here with you. I don't take that for granted at all. That's a, that's a humbling privilege. So are you ready to uh, get into the Word of God? He's, uh, when, when I met with Pastor, he was talking about, um, he's been talking about leaving a legacy. Anybody remember that? And uh, one of the things that he asked me to do was to come and to talk about what does it mean to live a, leave a legacy of worship? How many know that every, what we were just doing up here is not just singing songs? We're not just singing songs. We're not just, just reciting words. Every time we come into the presence of God, and we declare who he is, humbly declare who he is, life-transforming power is happening in us. And you, you, I don't want you to take my word for that. We're going to look in several passages of Scripture, look in the Word of God to see what he says about the power of song, about the power of words of worship, and about the way that we come before him and present ourselves. Let me... Uh, uh, to start with, I've shared this with the worship team here over many years that we've, uh, we've become, we've had, they've come to our seminars, I've come here, we've had, this is, to see this team grow every single time I come is amazing. Uh, the first time that we came to lead worship here was uh, the very first Easter, and Alexis and Sarah and Jasmine were teenagers, and they were on the team singing. And to see the growth that the Lord has done is just amazing. But let me just share this with you. I've been involved in worship ministry for close to 27 years. And, uh, but I remember way back, I told the Lord two things I would not do. Anybody ever tell? Say, God, I love you, but. I said, I would never be a worship leader. And I would never go to India. And the first time I led worship was in India. <laughs> true, true story. But what I learned in, over the years, that uh, a legacy of worship was left to me and to many other people for years that we sat under our pastor. There was a man that left a legacy to us. Some of you might might have heard of him, Pastor Jack Hayford. He was the man that left a legacy of worship to me that I can now impart to you. And you have to understand, it's not about someone who speaks, someone who sings. God is an auditioning singers. Hallelujah. It's that we, each one of us, were created to worship the living God. There's not one person on this planet that wasn't created to worship the living God. It's why we're here. We just don't know it until we come to Him. But whatever is spoken today, whatever steps that you take to worship the living God, that's a legacy that you are living, and then that is what you are going to impart to your family, to your children, to the people around you, when you don't even realize it. Because you're not just, you're not talking about a legacy, you're living a legacy. Amen? I want us to look at our first passage of scripture in Psalm, uh, in Exodus chapter, chapter 3. Uh, this is such, Moses, just before the Exodus, the Exodus probably is one of the most profound acts in all of human history. What happened in the deliverance of the people of Israel uh, and all of the events, the parting of the Red Sea, and all of the miracles that God did, very, the, the, very few things other than the incarnation and the resurrection that have such incredible impact to all of us today. But, but I, I want us to look at what the Lord was telling Moses. As the Lord is unfolding this big vision and this big plan in, in Moses' life. The first thing he says to him, he commands him to do 
one thing. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out? He said, The Lord, but I will be with you. And this shall be a sign, the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. The most profound things were about to happen. The study of how Moses responded and how he was like, Lord, send somebody else. How many have ever felt like that? When you know God is telling you something and, and one of the first things you want to say is, ah, I'm not worthy. I'm not this. How many, we list our I'm nots before we accept what God says we are. Anybody else? Well, Moses is no different. But the first thing he said to him was, when you have brought the people out, they will go through the Red Sea, they will see miracles never seen before in all of human history beside the flood. And yet, he says, bring them here to this mountain to worship me. Why does he do that? Because God knows that the destiny of this people that have been in bondage for 400 years are now, everything of their destiny is and will be established in worship. God is not only going to deliver the people, he is going to deliver their worship. He is going to show them the very purpose of why they were created. Now we could go, I, I could go on with this study probably for about the next four days and nonstop and have, uh, but to give you that God's intention for his people is worship. God does not intend that. Our, our pastor, he used to say years ago, he'd say, um, uh, God doesn't have a self-esteem problem. God isn't standing up there saying, worship me. Come on. He knows that worship was created not for him but for us. You say, how does that make sense? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Let's turn to the next passage of Scripture. In Psalm 22, uh, now you, you've got to look at that. David is one of, the most, one of the most profound psalmists in all of the Bible. He's not the only psalmist. But what, what, what David gave us was a legacy, a legacy of worship. The book of Psalms is a legacy of worship for all of us. If you haven't read through all, through the whole book of Psalms, I encourage you to do so. Uh, but here he's saying, David is having a real bad day here. How many have had a bad day? How many have had a bad week? How many have had a bad month? How about a bad year? How about a bad five years? We've all had bad times, Amen. Or hard times. Once we come to know the Lord, those times are not bad. They are challenging, but we know who goes before us. Amen? Amen? So David is sitting here and he's saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. How many have ever felt like that? I know I have felt like that. Where... I feel like I'm crying out to God, and I feel like he's not listening because nothing's changing. Have we ever felt like that? But David, in the midst of his, of, of, of his lamenting before him and crying before him, he says, yet, say yet. yet. Say it again. Yet. You are holy, enthroned on the praises of your people. What does that mean? Literally, in the original language, enthroned means to build a throne to the living God. What we were doing in, li in lifting our praises is that in the spirit, a throne was being built. And the king of the universe is sitting on that throne. He doesn't say, when I show up, then your praises will have power. He's saying, I will be on your praises. Other translations say that he inhabits the praises of his people. It says he abides in the praises of his people. He is established in the praises of his people. What does this mean? It means that our praises usher in the presence of God. You say, but isn't God always, I mean, isn't he like always here and always with us? Yes, he is. But he's established 
in our praises in here. Where his people worship him, he will establish who he is in us. So let me offer this to you. If he is enthroned, and that's what the word of God says, if he is enthroned, then if a throne is being built, then if a throne is here, his presence is here. If his presence is here, his glory is here. If his power is here, then all of that is there to transform our lives. When we worship the living God, we're not just singing songs. We are singing and establishing his presence because that is our pathway. Worship is a pathway of relationship with the living God. Amen? Amen. It'll, it'll start to come all, all to come together. And it's not just what we do here. Worship, as Pastor has been sharing with you, a legacy. A legacy of worship is, in, in essence, a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of worship. It's not just singing when we come together. Many of you don't sing because you don't think you have a good voice. Especially the men. We mumble. I don't want anybody to hear me because I don't want them to hear my voice. I have a lousy voice. I don't want anybody... How many of you have ever felt that way? Come on. There's no big rebellion of why we don't sing. It's we just feel self-conscious. But I have news for you. God isn't auditioning singers. What God is doing, he's looking for hearts of worship. Hearts who will lift up their praise to him. Doesn't matter what key you sing in. If they're singing an A, you can sing an H. Doesn't matter. As long as your praise and your heart and you're, if you're singing out of tune, that's okay. Because by the time it gets to heaven, it's purified. And it's all in tune. Oh, it's so beautiful. And folks, this isn't what I'm saying. I don't care whoever preaches, and I know that, our, that, that your pastor believes this. If what I say does not concur with the word of God, then it's just my opinion. I'm not here to give my opinion. I am here to, in the best that I can, and my limited ability is to impart his truths to you, not mine. Yes? So if he is established, and as I said, where his throne is, his presence is, his glory is, and his power is, then I am now have the opportunity as I'm standing there to allow God to transform my life. I've seen miracles in the context of worship. I'm going to share one story in just a moment. But the miracles that I have seen that have just happened in the context of worship, I've seen people that were saved without ever hearing the word preached, but in the context of worship, and their lives were transformed. The legacy of worship is how we approach the throne room and what we do with it. What we do when we leave here how we decide that we are going to be worshipers of the living God. Unfortunately, I think the, the, the concept of contemporary worship, what worship is, has been a little skewed. It's become a little uh, so much more performance-oriented often than it is about, about the visitation of God. We become more concerned, and churches become more concerned of the presentation of, of the, of, the, of the worship rather than an anticipation of a visitation from the living God. You see the difference? And look, l let's face it. Without, without God's presence, it's just great music. And great music is great. I love great music, but if I want to be impressed, I'll go to the Hollywood Bowl. We don't come to church to be impressed, do we? We come to church to encounter the living God. We come, the songs that we were singing, Lord, I want to know you more. I want to know you deeper. Lord, I give you my heart. We're desperate to hear from the living God. Every time that I, whether I'm here or whether I'm home with my wife, and we just are worshiping together, and we just lift our, just yesterday morning when we were praying about today, uh, my wife, she was with us at the first service, and uh, 
we were praying and we were and we started uh, um, singing this song and we both just began to break down in tears. It was almost like, what is God doing? Because we felt something that just that had just overtaken us. And I think what it is is that we, when we allow God to have His way in us in those times, when we sing, whether we can't sing. We're going to talk about singing through tragedy. Look at what David did. It is worst, he said, God, I worship you. Yet, no matter what I'm going through, why? Because we don't worship him because of our feelings. We worship him because he alone is worthy to be praised. Amen? That's why we worship him. So I think... A good way for us to, to start in, in understanding, what does the word worship mean? I mean, just the word. If I were to look in the dictionary, uh, not just in the Bible, but in the dictionary, what does the word worship mean? And if I were to go around the room, as, as I've done in classrooms, and I will ask students, they'll say, what does worship mean to you, or what do you think it means? And I'm sure all, many of you would have an answer, and there wouldn't be any wrong answer. It means surrender. It means adoration. It means declaration. It means uh, uh, coming before him. It means intimacy. It could be all those different things. But what does the word in the original language mean? So in, in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, the word worship is shaka. In the Greek, it's proskuneo. And in, from Old and New Testament. Well, what does that word mean? Worship, what does that mean? The word worship, the, the, the definition, the purest definition of the word means this. It means to be prostrate. It means to bow. It means to kneel. It means to come to, in the humblest physical position there is. There's no more humbler position than right here. Amen? And that's the definition of the word. Think about that. So, and you know, it, 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 it's always kind of amazed me how uh, in many churches that I've gone all over the world uh, where, where you, you don't see many people kneeling down. Kneeling in church, what a concept. But that's the very definition of the word. So whether we're kneeling down or whether we're standing up, the posture of worship is this. Lord, I need you. Greater are you who is in me than he who is in the world. Without you, I can do nothing. Great and greatly to be praised are you, O Lord. That's the... That the literal definition of the word, to be down in the most humblest position. I want us to look at um, Isaiah chapter 66. I love this passage of scripture. First of all, I love the fact that it says, thus says the Lord. This is probably, uh, well, there's many passages of scripture that talk about, that can uh, um, express and describe a legacy of worship. But I love this passage. First of all, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. That's a big God. Doesn't that describe a picture of a big God? Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What is the house that you will build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be declares the Lord. What he's saying here is, look, there's nothing that you can do for me. There's no house you can build for me. There's nothing, anything and everything you bring to the table, I gave you anyway. We can't impress God with our gifts. Why? Because he gave them to us. Whenever we think that we're, you know, all that and, you know, in a bag of chips, God's going, huh? God is saying, no. I gave this to you for a purpose. All of this is given to you for a purpose. Now, now watch what he says. So basically what he's saying, don't worry, nothing you can do for me. I've already done it for you. But 
I love that word in this context. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble, contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. Our, our act of humility and our obedience to his word is what he looks for. It says in the NIV translation, it says that on this one I will esteem. First time I read that, I thought, man, I want to be esteemed by God. I want God, God to think that of me. He's saying, this is what I look for. Nothing you can do, nothing you can give me, but this is what I look for. So why is the understanding of a, of a spirit of humility and obedience so important to God? Out of all the things in the universe, this is what he looks for. If I were to go around the room, you'd all have, you'd all have answers, you'd all have reasons. And they, there, there wouldn't be a wrong, a wrong answer why those things are so important to him. But I submit this to you, the reason out of all the things that he says I'm looking for is humility and obedience is because those are the two things that I can refuse to give him. We can all refuse to humble ourselves, walk in our pride. We can all decide that's true and I should do that, but I'm going to do this. We've all been there, amen? We've all... We have all been in a place where we know what to do, we know what God is saying, and either we feel we can't do it or something distracts us and we're not able to do it. But I wanted to, here's a guarantee. When you have Jesus living inside of you, there's nothing he won't do through us. At anything that we think we can't do, we can do because he enables us to do it. All he says is, Come before me with your humility and obey my word. That is the beginning of living a legacy of worship. Right there. To walk in his presence, to think about our marriages, to think about our relationships, to think about our work, to think about all those the things that we do every day, to think of them in terms of First and foremost, I submit to the living God. Because what is worship? It's submission and surrender. When we sing, when we're, when, when we're embarrassed to sing, that's an act of humility. If we don't feel that, that if we're not feeling well, or, we're, or we're so, we have so much fear inside because we don't know what's going to happen next, and we come to worship Him anyway, that's humility. That's an act of faith is what that is. When we least feel like singing... What are we going to do? Sing. When we do that, power. God infuses us with his power. You see, I can go preach, I can go preach a salvation message. It's not me or anyone else that brings, that brings people to Jesus. I can't bring anyone to Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit. I just got to show up and speak the words from his word. When I do that, then it's up to the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing in worship. When he comes, the Spirit of God infuses us with his truth, with his power. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. And really, all we're doing is every time that we gather to worship, we're just rehearsing for heaven. That's what we're going to do in heaven. We're gonna, but we're going to be doing it forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Forever and ever and ever and ever. There's not going to be any preaching in heaven. All the preachers are out of business. You know why? Because the living word is right in front of us. And we're going to be worshiping him for all eternity. So, I want us to look at uh, three aspects of our worship uh, when, when we gather. What, what, what begins a living that legacy? There's the song of worship, there are the words of worship, and, there are, and then there are the acts of worship. The acts meaning lifting our hands, clapping our hands, bowing and kneeling. Uh, so uh, uh, the first passage I want us to look at is Psalm 33, and it'll be up on here. Sing to him a new song.
play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Throughout all of Scripture, you'll see where the Lord will, that the, the Holy Spirit through the writers will command, sing. In 2 Chronicles 20, when, when the army of Israel were outnumbered something like 100 plus to 1, and they were, and as they were standing before God, and the Lord said, rather, he, he, he didn't say get together and plan, plan a, a, a military strategy. He said bring the people together, bring them together to pray. The people prayed. When they, were, when they went out to battle, what did they do? They didn't send the army first. They sent the singers and the musicians. Now, I know a lot of singers and musicians in my life. And if I were to tell them, we're going to go before the army, we're, we're going to be the first targets of the, of, of the enemy. Well, <laughs> we love you, Lord. The point is, he said, send the singers and the musicians. They obeyed God. And it was through the power of worship, because God had gone before them, that confounded the enemy, and the people of Israel were victorious. But it started with worship. And it ended with victory. Let me say that again. It starts with worship, singing and praising and declaring who God is, and then it ends in victory. See, look, if we are hesitant to sing in church, if we're his hesitant to declare the truths of God in church, how are we ever going to do it out there? If we're shy in here or a little embarrassed, how are we ever going to tell someone that we come across who needs, to, who needs hope more than anything in the whole world? How are we ever going to declare? How are we ever going to speak the truths of God if we don't do it here? This is the safest place. Amen? So I encourage you to sing, no matter what key you sing in, and declare the words, the words of faith. Psalm 40, verse 3 says, He put a new song in my mouth. A song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Isn't that interesting? He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Through our declaration, people's lives are changed. So, for example, as what does it mean, put a new song? I, you know, I don't know what that means. I, when, 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 the, when the singer or the worship leader starts to just to start singing and the words aren't up on the screen, what do I do? Well, if I were to say, to sing, hallelujah, sing, hallelujah, you are worthy. That's a new song. That's a new song. So if the, if the worship leader starts singing, Singing, all you have to do is say, I don't know what to sing. Just sing, hallelujah, hallelujah. Find a note and hold on to it for dear life. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. hallelujah. Whatever you got to go. It doesn't matter. Because why? He's not looking or auditioning singers. He wants people that are willing to step in faith and say, I will worship you. Say, yet. No matter what. I will worship the Lord. Psalm 118. I love this. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. See, when we worship in the midst, I don't have time to go into this, but there was a, a, a season in my life of great tragedy. And I, and, and I remember hearing our pastor on a Sunday morning. This was years ago. And he came out from in, in, in front of the pulpit, and he digressed, and he said, and he looked at everybody, and he said, when you least feel like singing, in your pain, worship the Lord. Wow. I sat in my seat knowing what I was going through, and I started every day. I would get up in the morning, and I would be just in tears because of the tragedy that happened in my life. And I just started, oh, I sing praises to your name, just it couldn't even barely get it out. But boy, faith was built up in me. The circumstances didn't change immediately, but what happened? I changed. That's what happens. I want the living God to impact my life and to change me 
like, to look like him. I want to be like you, we sang today. Let me tell you a quick story, power of song. Uh, uh, I was in, in, uh, in South Africa, um, and I, I'll, I'll never forget this. We were doing an, a, a worship, um, uh, an outreach, and we were in this open area where we were, uh, there were, there were apartment buildings and complex all, you know, all around us. We were in the middle of this little um, uh, clearing, and we were invited to come to bring a team. We had three or four pastors, and he says, we're just going to worship the Lord, and God's going to do something powerful. And the, the hosting pastor, said, he, he heard the Lord say that to him. So we went there, and we started, we didn't, there was no preaching. We just started worshiping and declaring songs, uh, um, you know, like today. We were talking about the unstoppable God, and just began to sing praises and, 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 and worship. And so people started hearing it, and they, they were coming downstairs and listening and, you know, and coming down. And so it was a few people, and then I invited people if they wanted, if, 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 if there was anybody just wanted prayer in their life, if never had anybody pray with them, they wanted to come forward and pray. And so some people came, came forward. So as we were worshiping, I remember my eye catching this, and it was all on, way on the other side of the, of the, of the uh, area. And there was a woman that was being carried down the, uh, the outer stairs of the building. And when she got to the bottom of the stairs, they gave her her crutches. And I mean, she was, she couldn't, she couldn't walk without her crutches. There were a couple of people, her, her good friend helping her. And she was, so she's walking towards the front where, where we were. And it was a long walk and she was moving real slow. And we just kept worshiping and worshiping. And I'll never forget, she was getting, it, 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 I'm seeing her coming closer. I'm thinking, she's coming to pray. Now, as, I, as, I'm, as I'm leading, I'm thinking this, she's going to ask for prayer for healing. That's what I'm thinking. So the man of God that I am, <laughs> I stood there and I said, this is what, what was going through my mind. Oh, please don't let her come to me, Lord. I don't pray for healing. This pastor is the one who has the power to pray for healing. Anybody ever felt that way? Lord, not me. I don't know how to. Yeah? Am I th or am I the only one? Okay. So she's walking, and I'm literally sitting there saying, I hope she doesn't come to me. Because I was putting more stock in my deficiency than in what he could do. How often do we do that? So she comes. Guess where she went? She had a choice of four, and guess where she came to? So, so, she, so she starts to share a story, and she says, Oh, I don't know. I heard the music, and I just had to come down. I've never, something, I just felt something. I've never felt the music, and I had to come down. Well, when I heard her say that, my faith just went, and I began to just pray for the Lord would heal her body, that the Lord would, 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 would remove whatever is preventing her from walking. I mean, I'm just praying this prayer of faith and healing over her. And she's in tears. So she's starting to walk away. And I said to her, I said, I said dear, I said, is, have you ever asked Jesus in your heart? And she said, oh, I can't do that. And I said, why? She said, my husband and my son, she, they would not like that. And I said, with all respect for your husband and your son, this is just between you and God. Yes, I want him. I want God. And I just want him. And I began to pray. She pray we, we prayed. She prayed prayer of salvation and repentance. And then, and, and, and she, she took my hand. She said, thank you. And she started to hobble away. I just thought, wow, Lord, you are incredible. How amazing that was. And later I said, forgive me for for uh, putting more stock in what I can't do than what you can do. But I, wait, there was a lot more to come. So all of a sudden, we're praying for people and still worshiping, and we hear this scream. And we couldn't really see because of where the people were. At one point, we began to see, and she, this precious lady, was jumping up and down. Her crutches were down, and we're, and, and we're going, oh, my gosh. And all of a sudden, people that lived in that area that knew her, they all started to come down because they knew that she couldn't walk. And then her friend comes running up to me and says, she can't walk. She couldn't walk. You don't understand. She couldn't walk. Well, that day, 
as people were coming down, 150 people received Jesus that day. <laughs> power of worship. Power of worship. Don't ever, as you are beginning to move into this year, God wants to use you in ways. Don't, don't create a scenario of what you can or can't. Because if you do that, you won't hear the impossible that God wants to do through you. The more that God does in me and through me, the more I realize I need him. So don't ever think, the moment that you hear anybody say, oh, I got this. That's the thing you should doubt. Because I don't got, I ain't got nothing without God. So he wants to do something in you specifically that you have never imagined, you've never dreamt. But he's saying, will you trust me to do it through you? Then there's the words of worship. The words of worship. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Psalm 34 verse 1. My tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Again, if we are willing to declare who he is, and if we're not willing in here, how are we going to do it out there? The words of praise. We read, we've read in the story of Joshua and what happened when, when and, and the victory that happened when all of a sudden, after, after a week of silence, they began to lift praises to the Lord. When it says shout to God with a voice of triumph, it doesn't mean to make a lot of noise. It doesn't mean yell. It means declare who he is. God, you are great. You are a healer. You are awesome. That word should really only be reserved for God. But anyway, that's a whole other commentary. Get off the soapbox. Anyway, awesome belongs to God. That word, why? Because awesome means awe-filled. I, I am in awe of this. I am in awe of God. I am not in awe of coffee, haagen ice cream. But we do say it's awesome, don't we? Anyway, I will leave this subject. Uh, it's become part of our, but God is who really is awesome. So when we say, we speak words, if you say, I don't know what to say, hallelujah, Lord, I come before you today, Lord, I don't know what to say, I just say, Father, you are, you are great, I put you in my life, hallelujah, hallelujah, say hallelujah. Say it again. You just, spoke, you just spoke Hebrew. Praise the Lord is what it means. Hallelujah means praise the Lord. So if you just say that, you are declaring the praises of God. Amen? Then there are the acts of worship. We lift our hands. Lift your hands right now. Lift them high. I know sometimes we're a little shy. We feel it's a little uh, whatever. But I think ultimately what it is, when we lift our hands before the living God, put your hands out like, like this when you lift for him. Lifting praises. When, when we come to him this way, what we are saying is, I release. I release all my fears. I release the things that I have held on to. I release, Lord, forgive me for my sin. I release it back to you. I am releasing the things that are, that are hindering me from growing closer to him. Now take your hands and turn them up this way. Turn them in this way. Now we're saying, now we're ready to receive. There, there's, a, there's an act. There's a meaning to this. Lord, I release I release, as you say, that we're to cast our burdens upon you. And now I, I receive whatever you have for me. Folks, don't ever be ashamed or embarrassed to raise your hands before God. And one of the, another act of great humility that I am saying, I need you, Lord. Amen? And then, of course, there's clapping our hands, clapping our hands that, that um, means it's not ju it doesn't just mean great job yeah it does it means that in our but but in the days of Israel when they clapped their hands you know what they were physically saying they were saying amen they were clapping their hands and it means amen 
also used in an act of warfare. And I know that, I'm, I know that your pastors have taught on this, on warfare. So, you know, we're, 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 we're saying, in Jesus' name, I break the power of this over me. Amen? So there's meaning. So every time you clap your hands, know that what you are doing in, in worship, like when the worship leader today, that he encouraged you to clap your hands, you know what you're saying? You're saying, amen, to everything that you just said. You're solidifying. You're putting a period at the end of it. All of these things have meaning. These are the tools to build a legacy of worship. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.